What up, meatheads? In this episode of the Meat Block Podcast, I had the great pleasure of being joined by Dr. Temple Grandin and Chuck Bilstein from Bunzel. In this conversational style episode, we talk about some of the things that small producers could do to bring their animals to market, the hurdles, the zoning, the logistics alone, as well as how important it is to invest in your employees and the knocking and the processing in all aspects of the industry. Temple Grandin is the leading expert in humane handling and has been for years. Chuck Bilstein is an expert when it comes to studying equipment, the mechanics, and the maintenance that it needs. If you work on the harvesting side, there's no doubt that you put in place practices that these two came up with. Bunzel Processor Division has been in the food, processing, and packaging industry for over 135 years, offering over 35,000 of high-quality products designed specifically to meet the needs of the meat processing, butchery, food processing, and janitorial industrial industries. Bunzel Processor Division also specializes in packaging equipment and supplies, offering the Multivac P-Series line of chamber packaging machines, as well as the Clarity line of shrink bags, roll stock film, and vacuum pouches. They have numerous product experts and outstanding customer service. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. Dr. Temple Grandin and Chuck Bilstein. Well, the other thing that I feel very strongly about, I mean, I've seen the USDA webpage where there's been problems. A lot of small plants, problems with stunning. And Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that problem is lack of knowledge. Yeah, They just don't know. I'm a good friend of mine, Erica Vogue. She's done a lot of work with small plants, and that's what she's found. Jennifer Woods up in Canada has done a lot of work with small plants. You know, just gun maintenance is one thing. Using the wrong stunner is -hmm. another one. Um, One of those plants that was on that website contacted me, and they were using a a captive bolt stunner way too light for these large pigs that they were um, processing. Mm -hmm. You know, that was lack of knowledge. And... I feel very strongly we got to help these small plants to not have problems. Coincidentally, uh, 10 years ago, Erica came to a plant I was working at, and I got my humane handling certificate from her, from a program that our, our plant uh, uh, had her uh, develop or help us with. And then what, what advice would you – so we hear, because there's so much grant money, and, pe- and a lot of farmers want to have – they want to take control of their own process. Well, we got to break through all the zoning stuff. Okay, let's just look at where we got problems. Yeah, zoning is big. I think people zoning uh, is really big because the the issue I I'm seeing or the the problem or the question I get asked a lot is a lot of a lot of growers out there aren't able to you know because plants are booked out a year or six months uh, and then they you know get in contact with the grant writer and then they're like okay I could. I could do my process. And and I think they don't realize how hard and how many hurdles there are. Everything from uh, truck driving to zoning, to even finding butchers, to even finding someone who is um, has, who could understand the weight and the, uh, and the consequence or of humane handling stunning. Okay. Uh, because that is, um, as someone who's done that, it, it's certainly not something I, I look forward to when I'm put in that position. One, because it, it almost gives me an anxiety attack. That's why I've been so far removed from that process for so many years. I think that, one of the important things is, is once you find someone that understands the importance of that stunning process, that animal handling process within the plant, do whatever you can to hang on to that person yes. and keep them in that position, continuing education with them for improve uh, process improvement. And I think that's where a lot of the smaller plants could really use a lot of that help, understanding the importance from, from walking off the trailer, the animal walking off the trailer all the way up through the restrainer and then the stunning process itself. Well, I think another thing is, is to send that person, maybe the NAMI um, animal welfare conference too. Because uh, it also shows that person that 
you want to get them out. And that person also will talk to other people. It's important. And um, uh, in some states, they've uh, really cut through a lot of the red tape on getting these plants started. Mm-hmm. And Uh-oh. one state, I think I'll leave the name of the state out of it, but uh, for the custom exempt type of plants, they are having the local health department inspect them because you've got to have some kind of oversight. I've been in absolutely disgusting game processing places. I mean, like gag a maggot, throw up, you know, <laughs> vomit types of places. Oh, yeah. And and you've got to have some kind of oversight. And this one state was just having a local health department that inspects restaurants inspecting them. That's not mm-hmm. ideal, but that's better than nothing. Yeah. And now there may be others that, that are good. I mean, mm-hmm. Some people just don't know. I mean, I've seen people out in a ranch butcher steer and they know how to, you know, lay it out on the hide on the ground so that mm-hmm. the, the meat only touches the inside of the hide. Mm-hmm. And I uh, just doing, you know, really simple tools and, yeah, I've seen that, and I, I saw a guy do that at Feedlot one time years ago, mm-hmm. and did it really cleanly. Yeah, it, yeah. There, there's amazing. Um, there's this guy out of Australia, and I see how he he mostly does um, like old dairy cows, and just seeing how clean he is and his custom exempt or whatever Australia's equivalent is, and he's yeah, it, it's like magic with a knife, and then he splits the cows with a cleaver you know wow yeah. that's old school yeah mm-hmm. um but w- is there any uh besides zoning uh d- are are you finding a shortage in are you seeing a shortage in people who want to get into this industry well there's a of- lot of ranchers that want to get into it like when covid hit when it first hit i was the phone was ringing off the hook i was getting emails all mm-hmm. kinds of people um getting interested in this and I've um, you know been out now recently doing some traveling. Lots of people are, uh, want to do this, and mm-hmm. we need to be helping them. And it looks like like three big issues here: the CDL truck driver issues, zoning, and permits, and finding trained staff. Those are three kind of things. And some states have just cut through the bureaucracy on the zoning part, and the CDL mm-hmm. thing. Uh, a hypothetical now. I got my staffing and my zoning and I had, and I want to build uh, a small scale, uh, uh, you know, slaughter floor that could do what uh, seven beef a day. What things should I implement that would help ensure uh, good humane handling practices and good employee safety? Well, the other thing I talk to people about is power requirements, water requirements, and how are they going to get rid of the innards? Mm-hmm. That yeah. these, these are things that all have to be, be figured out up front. Um, you know, a certain amount of innards you can compost, but then in some states that's not legal. Yeah. F- fortunately, here in Washington, when we do on site, uh, that a lot of the farmers have gardens and other things and have a very, uh, you know, comprehensive compost um program and it's, it's pretty impressive and then you go and you see all the heat coming off these things and they have probe thermometers going deep with inside this this bin and you know they have the stages and then like oh this is now just this is now just soil and it's part of their soil enrichment well it's amazing what they can compost you uh one time a hundred steers at a time big piles i uh, didn't smell a thing from it i uh, and they knew exactly how to do it well, on my main handling, you look at the USDA website. I went through that whole thing on the plants that had problems. Um, you know, captive bolt stunning, um, small plants. That was um, where a lot of problems are. And some of it's lack of knowledge. And this is where you need to get really good training materials out to them. Because I think a lot of these people are very isolated. Mm-hmm. And, and because I've talked to people that do audits. And I... Uh, they're just hungry for information. I, I, I know a lot of people that do audits and at a guy went out, I can't obviously say where he went or who he is, but just recently mm-hmm. went out to a small plant and their shooter rusted out and then an animal got his foot stuck in the thing. And mm-hmm. he was trying to figure out how to fix it. That's something we always would get a strip of steel and weld it along the bottom of the chute that would fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, but things as simple as some of the new rubber floors that are available, you know, like mm-hmm. animat stuff. They may not know about that. 
Yeah. I mean, things that to a big plant's just like little tiny basics. Little mm-hmm. plants don't know about. Yeah, they, it, the simple of like, uh, I've been to a place where w- the they took a almost like an angle grinder and then ground grooves in the concrete to get some sort of traction. And then yeah, and you um, can saw cut. There's also um, contracting services available for that. And mm-hmm. a lot of people don't know about some of the most basic things. Like, mm-hmm. okay, if you, if you have a, a slippery stunning box and you want to do the uh, rods on the floor, here's one mm-hmm. really simple thing. You, n- you never crisscross the rods like this. The rods have got to be uh, okay. cut. Butted. And so that uh, they got to be butted so that they, uh, the grid lays completely flat. That is really important. And another thing is don't use half-inch rod. Half-inch oh. rod is 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 going to bend. It's got to be three-quarter, one-inch rod in a square pattern, and you got to cut those little pieces, do the difficult welding. Mm-hmm. Don't crisscross them on top of each other because they're going to get their feet caught in it. Now, yeah. this is something basic I've been talking about for 40 years. I mean, some people say, well, Tumble Grandin just talks about the same stuff. Mm-hmm. But with a lot of these little plants, they don't know stuff this basic. Yeah. Things, okay, what could you do for the floor of a, a stun box? If it's a metal bo- floor on a stun box, I'd use the rods. Um, when if I build a stun box, concrete floor, I've got to make sure it's grooved deeply. And I've got diagrams and stuff on Brandon.com about that. Mm-hmm. Yep. But and I'm finding one... like in okay. talking to the plant about the stunning of a plant got in trouble with the USDA on stunning a big peg. And he was using a little lightweight captive bolt stunner that just wasn't doing a job. I told him that's not going to work. You're going to have to go and get a big, heavy inline captive bolt stunner. And I refer him to you, Chuck. Yeah. But he was using a wrong stunner. Just the wrong, the wrong stunner. And, and I think that's stunner. one thing. That's I, I think, you know, a lot of the small plants just, just feel, hey, I just need a captive bolt gun. I'm just going to go out and buy one. And sometimes they look at just price instead of really understanding what that that system is should be used for or what its limitations are. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I was going to bring up for, for a lot of these small plants that are, or people that are considering a small plant, you know, if they're going to do multi-species, I go into these smaller plants throughout the U S that they use the beef knock box, not only for beef, yep. but they also use it for stunning hogs and for lamb. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, when you've got an oversized beef knock box and you're trying to electrically stun or captive bolt stun a hog or a sheep, there's a lot of room in that. And it, it puts a lot more stress on the animal because someone's trying to approach its head to do this, the proper stunning process, whether it's a probe or a stunner, you know, need to put together some type of a game plan. How am I going to handle the smaller animal? in that larger mm-hmm. knock box, okay, some type other, of an insert, anything like that. Well, the other thing I've seen people do is um, just run maybe five or six pigs or shape uh, out through the beef stun box into the beef shackling area. Sure. And just stun mm-hmm. them in a group. And I've actually seen it done really well mm-hmm. by a person that was really skilled. Right. With the animals just, you know, in the, in the um, shackle area for the beef. Now, the question you might ask is, well, one animal seeing another animal get shot, do they get upset about that? Well, one of my students, Morgan Schlumpenkotter and then Lily Calloway Edwards professor, um, got a paper out on this. And when you look at the pegs in the, in the shackling area, the first peg was more stressed than the last peg because they got stuck in the beef chute that was not designed for pegs. Mm-hmm. And they, they're the, at watching the other animals was not stressful. Sheep, the problem you've got is when you get to the last lamb, it's isolated. And then right. they're freaking out because they're isolated. But you can do what this paper shows is that you can do group studying with very, very low lactate levels. Mm-hmm. Very, very low. And, yeah. and I have seen it recently done in a beef shackling area with pigs and done really well. With a, with a person that knew what they were doing and they were using the right stunner. The other thing we still have got to keep talking about is things like damp cartridges. Yes. And we've got to keep talking about that. You know, I tell them, you know, just keep them in the office and bring out what you're going to need each day. You know, container with a desiccant in it. Jason McAllister talks about that all the time. Mm-hmm. And you've got to take your gun apart and clean it. Yeah. And, um, and- 
I was talking to Jennifer Woods and she says, oh, they have them all nice and clean on the outside. And then when she opens them up, they're all filthy on the inside. <laughs> and you got to treat it like your finest hunting rifle. That's yeah. how you got to treat that captive bolt stunner. Yeah. And Chuck and I, uh, we've talked about a lot of people don't understand that the rotation of the bushings. And if you're using, if you buy the, the biggest, um, you know, the, the biggest shell that's going to pack the biggest punch and you're only using it for, you know, 50 pound lambs, then you're going to wear out those bushings incredibly Very fast. fast. And that's gonna, right. And, and so I think, it, yeah, people need to understand that. And I think companies need to really invest in the person who's doing that job to educate them that if you t- take out what you need, have a, a really good, uh, have a backup program uh, with a backup stunner or another device, preferably not a weapon, and someone next to them that if you if you unfortunately get a missed knock, then you're not flustered and fumbling around reloading it that you had that other person pick up a captive bolt and then administer that second stun. Um, well, then the yeah. other big problem is things like using 22 shorts. That's not going to work. Yeah. Um, and I... Uh, you yeah. you know, they. I think uh, looking at that USDA webpage just came out. A um, whole bunch of little plants on there, all captive bolt gun stunning problems. I, a lot I, of it's I, lack of knowledge. We've got to educate them. I really don't like uh, using uh, live live ammo or, or weapon in because uh, I I worked with this inspector and he had a. Um, like an army helmet because he was in the service and he wrote USCA and that was his hard hat. And I was like, why are wow. you wearing that? And he's like, because every once in a while at some plants, you could hear a ping and you could hear it shoot uh, off somewhere. I was doing some auditing. It was quite a number of years ago. Um, at a plant. I got a hunting rifle loaded, pointed at me. Mm. Wow. And I remember going back to the office and I threw a gigantic fit. Yeah. I that, I'm, um, yeah, I'd rather have them use the captive bolt. Mm-hmm. But yeah. on the other hand, I have seen you know a, a regular you know live weapon used from a humane standpoint just fine. Yeah, it, it, uh, you were talking about twenty two shorts. Uh, twenty two shorts are like a no no. Yeah. You've got to use uh, something more powerful than that. I've used twenty two mags. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, exactly. uh, and I, um, but not on not on. Uh, large scale beef, mostly on, on smaller, uh, on the smaller side of animals. Well, the other problem we've got with some of these grass fed animals is you got a lot of older animals, like one place oh, where yeah. that, where a plant uh, got in trouble with the USDA. It was a three-year-old market hog. Mm-hmm. Well, a commercial market hog is not three years old. Yeah. No, and they're going to have that. You've got a um, very, very hard head and that's where they got into trouble. Memorable experience that i've witnessed with a miss knock was on a 10 year old highlander um and it had all that hair and it had thick hide and everything like that and uh, the animal was able to be put down and we skinned out the head and you know the to see where the penetration was and it, it was right on right there it just didn't wow. didn't connect um, yeah well, and the other issue is i'm not a big fan of non-penetrating captive bolts I, 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 I fortunately never uh, used those. Um, well, I don't work as well. And sometimes people do it for whole owl slaughter, non-penetrator. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no margin of error. I right. strongly recommend a head holder if you insist on doing that. It has to yeah. be absolutely perpendicular with the, uh, with the head. And I one time was at a plant and they had a big Hereford with thick, mm-hmm. matted, curly hair, probably about three inches thick. And they hit him with that non-penetrator and a big, powerful non-penetrator. And he just stood there and moved. It was horrid. Yeah. Yeah. There's very few of those in the U.S. There's not very many non-penetrators in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Um, But I agree. And the thing, the other thing with a non-penetrator, you've got to be on contact to the head. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you are a half of an inch away from the head, you lose about 50% of that energy, of that knocking energy. And like Mm -hmm. that hair comes into play. Obviously, the, uh, well, that, this is this hair is the, really comes into play on. Well, that. this is the problem, and and uh, the scientific research is very clear that a non-penetrating captive bolt is less effective than a penetrating captive bolt. Yeah. It's very, you know, one, yeah. One of the things, just going back to the training set thing uh, or subject, 
you know, one thing that I found that is very useful in training, and I've done this at several universities that do it, is small plant operators take the time, allow your operators do the stunning operation and so forth, save some of those heads. Don't harvest the head if, if it's harvestable. Save those heads and split that head down right down the middle. And, and they physically see, they, they can touch it, they can see it. So you'll see the penetrating uh, bolt hole in the skull, and you can sometimes see the path, but it also shows them that to be able to train them on placement. Where mm-hmm. What is our targeting area? And it's one thing, one thing to see it on a slide. It's another thing to actually see this is what I, this is where I targeted. This is the result of the target. And maybe this is a better spot or I was spot on, whatever it might be. That, that is a very powerful training tool to be able to do that and show them that. Yeah. So I, and, I encourage that. No, I, I totally, totally agree with that. Also, I'm going to be a shameless book promoter. This is my book just came out last year, The Slaughter of Farm Animals. <laughs> nice. And it's got all the scientific research, but it also has got um, uh, lots of just practical um, uh, information on on uh, handling, how to handle animals, how different stunning methods work. Um, mm-hmm. And it's real up to date. It just came out real recently. Had to show I- that off. I'll have a, a link for uh, for that and your website in um, in the show notes of this episode. So I'll get I'll make sure I get that from Chuck. Yeah, and that you can link it. It's on my website on Grandin.com, but it's linked to Amazon. Okay. And awesome. and that everything's available on on Amazon. And then my other book, Humane Livestock Handling. This is where I have a lot of the information on how to groove floors, especially for cattle. Mm-hmm. Um, and construction techniques. You know, if you want to do something that's welded steel, I've uh, got a lot of details in that. Yeah. In uh, talking about the, the training and the placement, because you meet, uh, you know, some some farmers or people, and they're very surprised with the, because people are like right between the eyes. And then when I hear that, I'm just, it's just such a big red flag that this person is, well, that's a mistake. It's not between the eyes. Yeah. Uh, that's a very, very common mistake that gets made. I want to mention a few things on animal handling. If an mm-hmm. animal gets really fearful, really agitated, jumping around, they take 20 minutes to calm back down. Yeah. And you get a situation where an animal's really gone kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, it might be better to give it some time to calm down. And yeah. It takes 20 minutes for the full calming down. Also, another important thing is learning how to use the point of balance when you're um, moving an animal in the single file chute. And in the video that Chuck has that I, the basic cattle handling, pig handling talk that I gave, which is available, there's a little diagram in there that shows that sometimes the best way to get an animal to go forward in the stun box is to quickly walk back by it. Yeah. On the catwalk beside the stun box. And you quickly walk back by it. When you pass that shoulder, it goes forward. Yeah. But what you don't want to do is stand at the head and take a paddle or some other driving tool, poke its butt. People mm-hmm. make that mistake all the time. Don't stand at the head of an animal in a single file shoot and poke its butt. Mm-hmm. What often works is quickly walk back by it. Yeah. Then a quick walk back by it. And lots of times it'll go right ahead, right into the box. Another thing that's going to cause you terrible problems with getting an animal into the box is air blowing back into its face. Mm-hmm. You've got air coming out of that box back in its face. They won't go. And that's where you're going to have to work on ventilation. I've worked on improving a cattle entry by putting a light. You can experiment with the light. Mm-hmm. You may have to move the light because it may, it may have a reflection. Mm-hmm. And then you just move the light a little bit. And then the reflection goes away. Also, I've seen some prefabricated made stun boxes with the head holder that gave your animal a view of the slaughter floor. Yeah. That's not going to work. When that animal comes into the box, it can't be looking out onto the slaughter floor. Mm-hmm. You need to put a barricade up, a solid barricade up, you know, three or four feet in front of it. So that as the animal comes in there, it sees a blank wall. Yeah. And talking about that that a lot of people are like, well, who would have air blown in the animal's face? But you, it's not intentional. You have the humidity of, of the slaughter floor. And then you have this, um, 
you know, the knock box opens up and it could be, you know, winter time. And then you're creating all that humidity escaping through there, which would, you know, create a breeze or something like that. Right. Um, and then one thing that um, I, I've heard is, is the contrast that an animal, some animals, if they're walking on like, um, like a white concrete and then they step onto like more of a dark black top that, that the contrast confuses them. You know, these things like the changes in flooring, they'll block it up. They'll block it a change in flooring. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so when you're building something new, if you can avoid switching, like maybe from a concrete floor to a metal floor right there, the stun box will go in, in better. Wherever there's a shadow, a sharp shadow, um, watch in your facility to look at where animals are stopping. Now, maybe yeah. you can't get rid of that change, but in a small plant, let that animal put the head down, take a look at the metal strip or some other thing on the floor it doesn't like, wait for it to bring that head back up, then mm. you push it. Yeah. But don't push it when that head is down looking at that distraction. And where, where should the person knocking be, you know, who's who's above the animal? Because you're going to have someone who ideally will will help guide it through the knock box, but the knocker themselves, because you don't well, want them to like... A lot of plants have a wall in order mm-hmm. to keep dirty from clean separated um, mm-hmm. right at the stun box door. That, that's okay. a very common way that a lot of plants are designed. And then there's a doorway right there. Now, mm-hmm. if that, I find if you stand back against the wall, the re, you know, by the door that would go outside, then the animal coming in cannot see you. Mm-hmm. You don't yeah. want to be standing at the front of the box. They'll see you. Yeah. But I've been in a lot of plants that have that wall right at the stun box entrance. Mm-hmm. And you can uh, just stand there all day and they and the, they'll go right in. And then, mm-hmm. then you'd step up there and knock it if you were Typically, the stunner operator. Typically, the knocker is the guy that's controlling the guillotine door, the entry mm-hmm. door coming yeah. into the knock box. So that puts them in a good position to be somewhat hidden. Others that have their controls at, at the head end of the knock box suggestion would be to move that control for that for that entry door so that they're not standing there because sometimes they have that control whether it's an air cylinder or a pneumatic uh, or a hydraulic cylinder you know to control that from the front and be fully visible that can cause that balking issue as well it's another thing i'm going to recommend and this is something i was doing ever since i started get down in that chute and see what your animals are seeing okay, okay. your animals are coming up through your system and they're stopping and, and pigs, you're going to have to get down and sheep, you're going to have to get down at their level. But get down and look right at the place that they stop. And you're going to see something like a big reflection or maybe a moving piece of equipment. Mm-hmm. And then all you then I like to do a lot of experimentation with a cardboard and a portable light. Then I'll stick up a piece of cardboard somewhere and see if it fixes it. And then, of course, I'm going to replace it with something better than cardboard. But sometimes I just take cardboard and experiment. Or just experiment with adding a light or moving a light. But just get down mm-hmm. in there. Thanks, you're going to have to get on your hands and knees. I've done it. Cattle, you just bend over a bit and see mm-hmm. what your animal's seeing. And you mm-hmm. come up there and you go, oh, there's a blue glove hanging down there over the top yeah. of the box. And somebody's hand is wiggling in a blue glove. And the cattle yeah. see that. Or they can see a yellow boot through something. Mm-hmm. These are the things that you need to be looking for. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll give you my cell phone number. They can call me 970-443-1510. 970-443-1510. Okay. No, thank you. And for me, they can call me at 319-573-6121. Or they can email me as well. Charles dot Bildstein at bunzelusa.com. Now, okay. for me, the best thing is to just call me, 970-443-1510. Nice. And I want to say thank you again so much to both of you uh, for taking the time. And I think we got a lot of uh, amazing information out there. I learned a bunch from both of you. Um, and can uh, Temple, I've learned so much from you over the years. Um uh, just being in this industry and plans you've implemented and you know so 
I feel this conversation will help shed the light on on a bunch of things. We talked about the the shortage and the need for truck drivers and adequate qu- training and knocking. So thank you both so much, and I'll let you guys know when this is out. It was uh, great to be here.